Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Nathan Lawrence here, Hoshana Rabbah. Uh, I think it's very important that we address topics of a political, of cultural issues that are going on in our society around us. We don't live, none of us live in a, a bubble. None of us live in a, out in a cave somewhere or a cabin in the woods. We are part of the culture. We're in the world, though we're not of the world, to quote Yeshua. And so it is important for the preachers of righteousness to address issues that affect us all, one way or another. The prophets of old, Yeshua the Messiah, the apostles did not pull back when addressing cultural issues. Now, they were not necessarily politically involved, especially after the uh, demise of the nation of Israel as a political entity. Um, once the Romans took over, uh, there wasn't a whole lot that the servants of Yeshua could really do to change things politically. The spreading of the gospel became primarily or almost exclusively a matter of, of, of preaching to the heart of man. I don't see examples where they took the emperor, the Roman emperor or the powers that be to task. Um, but they certainly did confront evil and uh, that existed in the culture and especially in the church. Uh, and this is one area where the where many in the Christian church have, many pastors and leaders and teachers in the Christian church have literally um, been derelict. In fact, I read a, a poll recently which said that like 78%, I believe, or some high figure of pastors in churches do not address political issues going on in the nation. They may preach the gospel, but they are not addressing things that are going on uh, for whatever reason. Some of it may be because they are, uh, because of their tax exempt status with the Internal Revenue Service, uh, 501c3, which uh, I have never been involved in, whether the church I pastored for many years or this ministry. I'm not going to have a muzzle put on my mouth as to what I can and cannot say. Um, and that may be part of it. Part of it, too, maybe they don't want to offend. Uh, the people in their congregation who may have a different viewpoint. I don't know, whatever. I do know that prior to the American Revolution, uh, the past, many of the pastors, I don't know which percentage, but many of them um, really addressed the social, civil, and political and economic issues as well as local issues that were affecting people in the local town. Uh, what do they call it? They call it the Black Robe Brigade or something like that. Pastors that were addressing the social ills and things that were going on in that day that led up to the American Revolution. And in that sense, it prepared Americans who were at that time were British uh, citizens in the American colonies, it prepared them and gave them a moral foundation, a biblical moral foundation to rise up 
against the powers that be that were um, tyrannical. And it laid a, a, a kind of a, a moral and spiritual foundation. And even though many of our mounting, uh, founding fathers may not have been Christian in the, in this biblical sense that we consider it, uh, some of them were, like John Adams was, but many of the others, Washington, Jefferson, uh, Franklin, to name a few, were not. Although there were pastors who actually signed the Declaration of Independence and were some of our founding fathers. But even then, the ones that were not uh, outright Christians, they still had a Christian worldview to one degree or another, and it comes through. I would say that Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington probably knew the scriptures better than most Christians today. So I am going to address an issue that has been bothering me for quite a while. This is the month of June 2024. For most of my life, no, there was nothing really special about June, the month of June, except this is when summer started. And that was about it. But now, our nation, and I guess it may be beyond the borders of the United States of America, June is now Pride Month. Pride Month. It's a time when the heathens and ignorant Christians are celebrating LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transistor, queer, plus, 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 whatever else. Basically sexual promiscuity and deviancy. And I asked the question, June is so-called Pride Month, but really, what is there to be proud about? And that's what I want to talk about from a biblical perspective. And I know that I'm largely preaching to the choir in these videos. But maybe some of the seeds of what I'm about to say will fall on some fertile ground or some fallow ground maybe that will be turned up or maybe it will inspire somebody to say something to somebody or put some thoughts out there that maybe will make a difference in somebody's life. I, I could hope and that's my prayer before Yehovah Elohim. So I asked the question and I have my study notes which I've just published on my blog uh, on this subject, but I asked the question, what's the big deal about Pride Month? You know, we have the rainbow flag, Pride Month, LGBTQ, DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, wokeism, CRT, critical race theory, the NWO, the New World Order, ESG, environmental, social and governments, gender pronouns, and the list goes on and on of all the current terms that are now part of the lingua franca uh, the, the, the currency of our language. And we all know these terms, whether we like it or not. Who is pushing this agenda? It's definitely not Bible believing people, obviously, or people that know and really believe what the Bible says. There are people that claim to believe the Bible and follow the Bible who are press, uh, pursuing and, and, and pressing these issues. But uh, I question if they're even saved, and they certainly don't know their Bibles. And so, um, you know, if Bible-believing people, true, the true saints of the Most High are not pressing or pushing these issues, then who is? And I think that in itself ought to give us a clue as to the origin. If it's not God and godly people, what is the origin of this agenda? In 
And this agenda, Pride Month, is being celebrated, if you can call it that, from the White House all the way down to City Hall. The City Hall of a lot of our towns. I live in a town of 30 some thousand people. And each month they put out a, a newspaper about all the things that the city has done and how they're using their, your tax dollars and events that are taking place. And for the second year in a row, for the June 2024, there it is. The masthead, the banner for the city in which I live. The rainbow flag with the city logo on top. The name of the city, which I've crossed out because I don't want, not everybody needs to know where I live. Not that I care. Yehovah is my shield and I'm under the blood of Yeshua. But there it is. You know, it used to be the role of government, whether it's national or local, to make roads and highways and to maintain them and to build parks, to protect our borders, defend us from alien invasion, to create laws that, that, that help to keep people living together in peace, to, to defend the civil liberties enshrined in America in the U.S. Constitution, to, to uh, enforce laws and to protect the citizens, to lock up the criminals, and on a local level to make sure that the potholes are filled in the road. That when I turn on the water and in my kitchen sink, it runs. And when I flush my toilet, it goes away. But for some strange reason, our government now feels the need, whether it's at the national level, the state level, or the city level, to be social engineers. You know, I went back recently and looked at my the city charter for the city in which I live. The, the charter that mandates what the city is supposed to do. And nowhere in there could I find anything about telling me what to think, what to say, how not to think, how I need to treat other people or not, or sexuality, or um, you know, all of this diversity, equity, and inclusion, and promoting one sexual group over another. Nothing in there about that. Yet our leaders, like a bunch of imbeciles, a bunch of idiots, a bunch of indoctrinated lemmings, running toward the edge of a cliff, a moral and spiritual cliff. And I know m many of these people. The current mayor of my town is a client of mine for my tree service. The previous mayor of the town, I know him well. He's a client of mine. And the previous mayor of that, uh, to this mayor, and I could go back for mayor after mayor, I have personally known just about every mayor from the second mayor of our town for over the last 40 years up to the present one. They've been, most of them have been my clients. And half the people on the city council at any one time, most of them, have, usually half of them are clients of mine for my tree service. But they are like a bunch of lemmings following the agendas of, 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 of people above them. People who basically are their puppet masters. These are good people. These are nice people. But they're just following blindly what is the what's currently popular 
and will what what will make them give them political expediency what's politically expedient and will give them um currency to move up politically or give them popularity and everything they stand for all of these things i just mentioned that pride month represents and all the plethora of things that it engenders and promotes everything is anti-biblical everything it sounds so good oh diversity equity inclusion inclusion but it's all about against christian values every single thing biblical values traditional values that that the west western civilization was built on and now these people are forcing it upon us my city for example using my tax dollars whether it be to publish this kind of stuff or i have read in here where they have they're promoting um speakers at the local library to come in and to speak about diversity equity and inclusion and they have a series of speakers that are doing this and or they are um telling us putting articles in this in this paper over the last couple of years you know what pronouns to use and it goes on and on and they're using taxpayer dollars to do this to promote this new religion this new religion it is against everything that we believe. You see, as the nation has drifted away from a culture of Christianity and biblical values, these other things are filling the void because pastors and teachers and Bible, Bible believers have not been addressing these issues. Francis Schaeffer, in his book written 40, 45 years ago called The Great Evangelical Disaster, addressed this issue in that book. And he said it's because going back, for, back to the early 1900s, the church was not addressing these issues and calling it out for the spirit of Antichrist that it is. He called it secular humanism where man lifts himself up above the creator and puts himself on the throne of society, on the throne of his life, and lifts the state up, the government up as God. And to legislate morality or the lack thereof, and to tell us what to think, and to tell us how to act and to punish us if we don't think and act in that way. This is exactly what the Marxists did and are doing to this day in various countries, whether it's the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, China, communist China to this day, North Korea, Cuba, and many other countries that we could list. This is the rise of the spirit of Antichrist. The tenets of this new religion rapidly and militantly stand against nearly everything the Bible declares to be right and true. Face it, if you are a Bible believer, you are the target and are in their gun sights of the people that are promoting this. Like a vomit-inducing horror movie, the agenda of these new religious zealots who virulently hate Yehovah Elohim, the Bible and the Messiah, and you is coming to a theater near you if it hasn't already come. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Now, I'm not saying that <clears throat> it has come to my town. And I'm not saying all the people that are promoting it are evil. I, like I say, I know the leaders of our town and they're decent people. They're just deceived. I know them personally. I know them on a first name basis. Many of them.
including the mayors. You know, I have their, their cell phone numbers. You know, I can call them up. But, and they're good people. They just don't know because they've been spiritually blinded. They've been brainwashed by evil entities. And you know many people, many neighbors you have that are like this. And they've been blinded. You know, I live in a city, or I should say in the outskirts of a city, that is known across the United States as being one of the most libertine and licentious cities in America. It's the city of Portland, Oregon. You know, when all the Antifa riots and um, Black Lives Matter and all that was going on, Portland was at the forefront of this. In fact, the modern permutation of Antifa started in Portland, Oregon. Portland's unofficial motto is keep Portland weird. And it worships, there's, they, they've actually constructed an idol. It's a big statue in front of City Hall called, called Portlandia. It's, a, it's some Greek goddess looking thing with a pitchfork. And um, like the devil, it's actually a trident, like a Neptune or something. And Oregon, and Portland is driven, let's say the politics of Oregon is driven by Portland. But poor Oregon has, has enacted some of the most anti-logical lunacy that passes, has passed muster with the, the vast majority of the voters and politicians in our state. We were like the first state to, to legalize euthanasia. And, and we criminalized gun abiding, um, law abiding gun owners. We, we, we promoted defunding the police and paying and in, enabling people to be homeless and legalizing hard drugs. We have a, uh, we sell marijuana. There's a marijuana retail store on almost every corner. Uh, you know, we, 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 we let the criminals go. We, we, per, we allow nudity parading through the streets every year in Portland, the naked bike ride, bicycle ride, uh, full, on, full on nudity. Uh, and we could go on and on and on. They let the criminal, they open up the criminals and let, the, let them loose. Felonies, uh, 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 felonious criminals, felonists out of, the, out of the prisons. And yet they refuse to, to prosecute people that are attacking the police, attacking, um, you know, firebombing police buildings and, and federal courthouses. I mean, you could go on and on and on. And these are just a thimble full of the crazy ideas that have taken root in the, the fertile ground of this Bible intolerant, God hating state. Oregon is definitely, Oregon definitely lacks, you know, they, they promote DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But when it comes to tolerance and, 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 and expressing diversity and inclusiveness and equitability, for biblical values and Christians, not. They sooner cut your head off and 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 you know destroy you. So let's look at this thing about pride. And let me just digress here for a moment. You know, this is Pride Month. Um I asked the question, what is there to be pride about, proud about? You know, it's really curious that they use the rainbow as their symbol. This is very, very um, ironic. Very ironic. Lay down. The dog came up. Down, down, boy, down. He's trying to tell me something. It's all right. All right. Um, hallelujah. Um, my wife's taking a nap right now. She's very tired. And so I'm babysitting the dog, this beautiful golden retriever. A little bit of um, sanity in the middle of a crazy, ridiculous world. Uh, a beautiful dog. Okay. 
Come up here and say hi. Come up here, buddy. Come up here, Tech. Come. Yeah, here's Tech, the golden retriever. Isn't he beautiful? We were down on the beach, running down the beach just a little bit ago. Okay, you can get down. All right? All right, down. All right. That's Tech. Uh, my wife trains service dogs, so he's the one we have right now. Uh, and uh, they come through our, our home, and it's really beautiful. But anyway, back to the, back to this, uh, back into the gutter, talking about this subject. The, 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 the rainbow flag, it's rather ironic that the LGBTQ agenda has hijacked the rainbow as its identifying symbol. Why would they choose a symbol that Yovah Elohim used as a promise that he would not wipe the world clean again via a global flood because of the world's evil, including sexual promiscuity and deviance? Go read Genesis chapter 6, verses 4. Is not the use of the rainbow to represent the homosexual at all agenda no more than an upraised fist taunting, you know, in the face of Elohim, taunting him to bring judgment against them. And he will in times in the future if they don't repent. Okay, let's explore. I, I, that was a little digression. I just had to get that in there. So, so June is Pride Month. Why pride? Pride in what? What is pride really all about? What is the opposite of pride? That the moral de de degenerates are trying to cover up in themselves. And what does the Bible have to say about pride? So let's define the word pride. And this in itself is a very, very interesting study. Because if you go back for 180 years, the definition of pride has changed. From 1828 till 2024. You know, it's a fact that languages evolve and word meanings, languages and word meanings evolve over time. This is a natural phenomenon. Uh, this reflects cultural trends of a society, including its morals, values, and ethics, be they good or bad. That's just normal. Uh, sadly, and nowadays, words like inclusive, gay, and pride in the English language have taken on a different meaning such that we can't use these words, or if we do, we have to use them very carefully for fear that people might take, a, take our, um, the words to mean something that we did not intend. So I don't even use these words, or very little. So for the word pride has been captured by the homosexuals and their sexual licentious comrades in an attempt to promote their agenda and to make their deviant sexual practices acceptable to the masses. Even the dictionary definition of pride has evolved to mean something different than what it used to mean. The current definition of pride if you go on Webster's Dictionary on the internet, it means a feeling of deep pleasure or satisfaction derived from one's achievements, the achievements of those with whom one is closely associated, or from qualities or possessions that are widely admired, that, um, so forth. The second definition is consciousness of one's own dignity, Um, and then number three definition is confidence and self-respect as expressed by members of a group, typically one that has been socially marginalized on the basis of their shared identity, culture, and experience. Um, and then 
uh, they mention an example. The bridge was lit up in rainbow colors, symbolic of LGBT pride. Uh, the underlying theme of, let's see, black pride, Latino pride, the public event typically involving a parade held to celebrate LGBTQ identities. That's the current dictionary definition of pride. So now I pulled off one of those big, thick dictionaries off my bookshelf, still a Webster's Dictionary, from 1983. And here are the first three definitions that in 1983 for the pride. Number one, a high or inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. Note the word inordinate. That is lacking in the current definition of pride. Inordinate means it's not acceptable. It's illegal or, or not morally right. A high or an inordinate opinion of one's own dignity, importance, merit, or superiority. Number two, the state of be a feeling or being proud. Or number three, becoming or, or dignified uh, sense of what is due to one's own position or character. So that's the definition from 1983. All right, let's go back a little further. 1936. I have a thick Webster's Dictionary from 1936 in my library. <laughs> this is what how Webster's defined pride in 1936. Number one, the quality or state of being proud, inordinate self-esteem, unreasonable conceit in one's own superiority, manifesting, manifesting itself in reserve, airs, and evident contempt of others. So as we go back further in time, the term pride takes on a more of a pejorative connotation and meaning as something that is not acceptable. Now, let's go back to 1828. And the father of the modern dictionary in the English language, Noah Webster. How did he define pride? Number one, inordinate self, there's that word inordinate again. Inordinate self-esteem, an unreasonable conceit of one's own superiority in talents, beauty, wealth, accomplishment, rank, or elevation in office, which manifests itself in lofty airs, distance, reserve, and often in contempt of others. And then he quotes Proverbs 16, 18, Pride goeth before destruction. All pride is abject and mean. Those who walk in pride, he's able to abase. Then he quotes Daniel 4, 37, with regard to King Nebuchadnezzar. Number two definition, insolence, rude treatment, rude treatment of others, insolent exultation. So you can see that the term pride has evolved and it's a reflection of the downward slide, the declension of society as it moves away from a more biblical, Judeo-Christian-centric orientation to a secular, humanist, ungodly, degenerate, secular, amoral orientation, even to the point of hating Elohim and, I would say, spirit of Antichrist. In fact, I will go so far as, it, it is, as to say it is a descent into Baal worship. Now, Baal was the ancient, or Baal, was the ancient Canaanite god, small g god that the Canaanites who inhabited the promised land 
or the land of Canaan before the Israelites came in under Joshua, Moses and Joshua. This was their religion. And if you study the religion of Cain, uh, of, the, uh, of Canaan or Canaan and Baal, and it wasn't just the religion of the Canaanites, but it was also the religion of Egypt, Mesopotamia, Assyria, the Babylonians, the Greeks, all Persia, all that area. They all had different names for Baal. The Romans, but Baal is the term that the Bible uses. And basically Baal was a form of Satan worship. And it was anti antithetical to everything that the Bible stood for. And that's why Yehovah Elohim in the scriptures tells the Israelites to come in, to destroy them, to wipe out the Canaanites. He gave them over 400 years to repent. The Canaanites. And that culture was so demon-possessed that he said, wipe everything out. Man, woman, and child and even some, many of the animals, or most of the animals, or maybe all of the animals. They were totally sold over to every kind of sexual promiscuity, witchcraft, Satanism, and sacrificing their children to their gods, and on and on it goes. And that's the direction that our society has gone in and is going in. We sacrifice our children. It's called abortion. And now we are doing something that even, I don't even think the, the Canaanites did. And even Dr. Mangala, the Nazi doctor that experimented on people in the concentration camps during World War II, even things I don't know that he did, it called genital mutilation and castration of young children and teenagers going through so-called sex change operations. This is how far we have gone. Now, what does the Bible say about pride? It says a lot, and I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, you can go online and get my, uh, my study notes. But with regard to Baal, and Baal, and the worship of this demon God. And whether you believe in God or the Bible or not, if you are acquiescent, and if you are promoting these things, you do not know Yehovah Elohim, you do not know the Bible, and you are going along with the worship of Satan, whether you believe in Satan or not, you are defaulting to that societal downward drift and are going along, like I mentioned earlier, like lemmings to the edge of the cliff, following the masses on the highway to hell. Unless you repent and make a U-turn and get on the highway to heaven. So the, the book of Proverbs says that there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. All of these things that pride, the month, the pride month represents and all of these agendas all lead to death and destruction. Homosexuality leads to death. It leads to disease. It leads to suicide and, and, and sexually transmitted diseases. And it leads to, if enough people engage in that lifestyle, to the destruction of the human race because they cannot reproduce. Gender, trans, um, gender mutilation and and changing, so try to change genders and abortion, all these things lead to death of the human population. 
and lewd sexual practices, again, death and disease. And if death and disease do not catch up with you, if you continue in those things, the wages of sin is death. And the Bible is very clear about that. And the Bible, Yah is not desirous that anybody die, but that all come to repentance and turn away from these practices that lead to death. And these practices that are engendered by the king of death, the prince of the power of the air, Satan the devil, the god of this world, who comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and is a liar, and over-promises and under-delivers. And yes, he packages all of these things to look good, using the rainbow flag, for example, to look so beautiful. But the ends thereof are the ways of death. Make no mistake about it. Now, this is how the this is the general view of how the Bible views the sin of pride. And I'm quoting here from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia in its article on pride. Uh, let's say I'm paraphrasing. This is mostly a quote, but I but it's a little bit of a paraphrase going on here too. But this is how they characterize the biblical view of pride. Many of the Hebrew and Greek words, as well as the authorized version and the New English Bible variant readings, point to the root of pride as being lifted up high, whether literally or figuratively. Pride can be attributed to, uh, metaphorically to natural phenomenon that are literally high, such as the waves of the sea, because they are high and majestic. When attributed to humans, this sense of exaltation may be either positive or negative, depending on the relative height attributed to Elohim. Paul insisted that there is a positive kind of pride among Christians. He was proud of the churches. He had founded and wanted them to be proud of him as well, but was critical, uh, but was careful to ex explain that his success was entirely due to Elohim's gifts. Thus, his boasting was in the Messiah and was tantamount to thanking, to thanking Elohim. Pride is therefore legitimate only when it remembers to attribute all honor to Elohim. Elsewhere in scripture, however, pride is almost universally censured pride precisely because it refuses to thank Elohim, but instead cherishes an exalted opinion of self. In relationship to Elohim, pride is lofty, self-sufficiency, and in relationship to other persons, pride is haughty, lack of concern for their well, and lack of concern for their well-being. So you can see that the bottom line is what the world is proud about, Yehovah, in the Bible, often calls an abomination. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with Elohim. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of Elohim. The Bible has something to say also about this world's end times antichrist system that extols that which you have all calls an abomination. Scripture likens this system to a drunken, sex addicted, sex addicted whore, which we call the whore of Babylon. Let me quote from Revelation chapter 17, starting in verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, or many people, many nations, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, including presidents, governors of states, 
and mayors of towns, senators, congressmen, leaders of parliaments, kings, queens, um, you name it, city council members, all the way from the top to the bottom. They have committed fornication, spiritual fornication with this whore. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Yes, she has put out, this system has put out lies and made people drunk so they can't think clearly and they embrace this antichrist, this anti moral, degenerate garbage, which Pride Month represents. She has made the earth drunk on the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. That's the New World Order, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns a world-ruling system. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornications. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints, Make no mistake about it. She is against and opposed to and willing to murder literally or figuratively the saints and all people and every ideology that promotes and believes in this, the Bible, the word of Elohim. The blood of the saints. In her was the blood of saints and the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with a great admiration. Yes, you need to go. Place. The puppy starved for attention. Place there, the, uh, tech. Good boy. All right. What are the sinful practices the Bible considers to be an abomination. Let me read about a dozen examples of specific sins that the Bible calls an abomination. Eating unkosher food, Leviticus 11, Isaiah 66, 17. Homosexuality, Leviticus 18, 22. Idols and idolatry, and there's a whole bunch of scriptures starting in Deuteronomy 7, 25 through 26 and on. Worship of false gods, including child sacrifice, abortion, and being involved in heathen practices. Again, Deuteronomy 12, 31, 1 Kings 11, 7, and many more. Apostasy from Jehovah's truth and those who promote it. Deuteronomy 13, 4. Crossing, a cross, dressing, and confusing male and female genders. Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Unequal weights and measures are those who defraud others economically. Deuteronomy 15, 13 through 16, Proverbs 20, 10, and 23. The proud, liars, murderers, Evildoers who devise wicked plans, a false witness or liars, and those who cause strife and division among brethren. Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. Those who turn away from the Torah. Proverbs 28, verse 9. Those who pervert the true religion of the Bible. Isaiah 1, 14. And finally, Sexual perversions, including adultery and incest, Ezekiel 22, 11, and 33, verse 26. The Bible goes on to say that the saints are not to love the world or the things of it, 
And as a result, make no mistake, the world will hate Yovah's people because they are opposed to the world and its values, which are at its core of the spirit of Antichrist. And I have a number of scriptures here, which for the interest of time, I'm not going to give, but to back up this point, and you can go again online and get my study notes uh, on my blog. Yehovah has called his people out of this world. We are to overcome the world through Yeshua. Be not conformed to this world, but be, tr be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of Elohim. Romans 12, verse um, 2. And whatsoever is born of the Elohim overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Yeshua is the son of Elohim? 1 John 5, 4 through 5. Yehovah's people have called, been called to a higher walk. We've been called to a higher walk. Uh, and I quote Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'm not going to read it. But if you're a, a Bible-believing Christian, and if you watch this video up to this point, then you know what I'm talking about. You already know that. And you know what that walk is. Also, um, Colossians 3, verses 1 through 10, which starts out, If you were raised with Messiah, seek those things which are above, where the Messiah is sitting at the right hand of Elohim. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, and so forth and so on. So now let me ask the next question. What is the opposite of pride? Sometimes by studying the antonyms or the opposites of a word, it gives us insight into the true nature of that word and what we are to not be like. So what is the opposite of pride? Now, this is an interesting question since there are two possible answers, each of which is correct. The answer depends on uh, how you interpret the word pride. So the first and most obvious answer as to what is the opposite of pride is humility. And this is true. And really, this doesn't need any further explanation. You all have a sense of what humility is vis-a-vis uh, -vis pride. And the Bible talks a lot about humility versus pride. However, there is a, uh, a less obvious answer to the question, what is the opposite or the antonym to the word pride? And is it not shame? Shame. That's not a word you hear very much anymore. Shame. Because the world teaches you that you can do whatever you want, and there's no shame in it. If it feels good, do it. Yet the Bible has a few things to say about shame, and we're not going to go into that now, but you can look up the word shame in the Bible. And uh, do a study on that. But I do remember very vividly growing up in the 1960s that, and maybe some of you who are a little bit older, maybe uh, you heard the same words, but I can hear ringing in my ears if I did something wrong from my father. Shame on you. Shame on you, James Nathan. <laughs> you know, those were the worst words that I could possibly when I was a child, hear from my father. Shame on you. Shame. I knew. I, 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 I maybe didn't really understand the meaning of the word shame, but I knew it was not good, and I knew it was horrible that my father was rejecting me. I had done something really bad, very sinful. It's horrible. And I, I, it was just, you know, I hung my head. I knew I just wanted to crawl under a rug and disappear. The modern dictionary definition of shame is, quote, a painful feeling of humiliation or distress caused by 
consciousness of wrong or foolish behavior, a loss of respect or esteem, dishonor, used to reprove someone for something of which they should be ashamed. Now, I don't have a problem with this modern definition. It's a really good definition. And unlike the word pride, it has not devolved and taken on different meaning than what it used to mean. But just by way of comparison, I went back to Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary to see how he defined the word pride. And it's a little bit more poignant. A little bit more pointed, a little bit more descriptive. Let me read. A painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt. He adds the word consciousness in there. And guilt. The Bible has something to say about this. But let me read on. A painful sensation excited by a consciousness of guilt or having done something which injures reputation or by or by of that which nature or modesty prompts us to conceal. Shame is particularly excited by the disclosure of actions which in the view of men are mean and de are mean and degrading. When it uses the word mean it means average or degrading. Hence it is often or always manifested by a downcast look the hanging of the head in guilt or shame by blushes called confusion of face. So when shame comes on somebody, it's very, very hard to hide it. The face radiates that, the, 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 the physiognomy of the face, the facial expression. Number two definition, the cause or reason of shame, that which brings reproach and degrades a person in the estimation of others. Reproach, ignominy, derision, contempt, and so forth, dishonor or grace. This is very interesting that to see sexual deviance in the LGBTQ movement would pick the word pride to describe themselves. This is curious to me since um, I'm not proud that I'm heterosexual or a male. It's just a fact. For, um, for it, you know, I am what I am. And, I, and that's that. And I don't feel the need to convince others of the fact. And if I was a female, I would, you know, that would be that. And, you know, I can't change it. It's just what it is. And it's a fact. I don't have to tell or promote the idea that I'm male or heterosexual. It's no big deal. It is what it is. Now, if I were trying to be something that I was not, and it went against nature, and against my conscience, or against the Bible, or had been viewed in times past as shameful, degrading, immoral, or even illegal, but now it's not, wouldn't I feel the need to convince myself that my aberrant, if not abhorrent, uh, behavior was somehow good and acceptable? To strengthen my morally weak position, wouldn't I feel the need then to go out and con possibly convert others to my belief in an effort to lend credibility to my questionable moral position? And in so doing, wouldn't this somehow make me feel better about myself? if I could gain other people to believe as I believe? Wouldn't I choose appealing labels to describe my, my position in an effort to sway others to my belief system? You know, I don't have to uh, come up with labels to describe myself as a heterosexual or as a male because I'm not trying to hide the fact and I'm not embarrassed by the fact and I don't have to convince other people that I am because I am. It's what it is. And 
logical, thinking, rational people don't question this. Now, if I was trying to promote some wacky doodle idea, then I would need to engage in propaganda and lies and de deception to try to get people who were otherwise logical thinking and truth believing to believe my lie. And so I would need to come up with labels that made me feel better about myself, like pride, when in reality I'm promoting shame. And at the same time, I would need to come up with labels against those people that do not believe the way I believe. The dog is scratching and he's shaking the camera. <laughs> yeah, he's scratching himself and he's shaking the camera. That's why the camera was vibrating. He's right here at my feet. He's a sweetheart. Yeah, he's, he doesn't know what he's doing. It's, it's cool. Anyway, uh, it's okay. Um, they'd have to come up with names that were derogatory and mocking labels like homophobic, right-wing extremist, white racist, deplorables, white nationalists, and whatever other names that they come up with to, to, uh, to uh, label people that have traditional Judeo-Christian values. I mean, if you are right and on the right side of truth, do you really feel need the need to go all out to convince people that you are right? You know that you are right, and so you don't have to prove it. What's more, that little voice deep inside of you that is your conscience knows it, knows this, and gives you the inner peace to know that you are right because you're not doing anything that's causing you guilt or shame. However, if you go against your inner voice, guilt arises followed by shame. Adam and Eve discovered this immediately after eating the forbidden fruit. They ran away from Elohim because of guilt brought on by their sin, and they covered their nakedness because of shame. So shame is the child of guilt. And Noah Webster confirms this sequence of events in his dictionary dish definition that we quoted above. Shame in this sense is the opposite of pride and those promoting Pride Month and Gay Pride are actually full of shame and guilt. And by the use of clever psychological and propagandistic tactics are trying to divert attention from this fact and make themselves feel better about their sin. But in reality, they are empty, they are hurting, they are broken, and they're trying to cover up their guilt and their shame by indulging in hedonistic illegal, immoral sexual practices, maybe drug addictions, maybe um, other licentious practices, alcoholism, I don't know, whatever. But really, they're broken, hurting people. We need to have pity on them. We need to... You know, I feel sorry for them. They need Yeshua. They need healing in the inside. Many of them have been come from broken families, many of them were sexually abused, or whatever. And we pray, Father, that they, many, I think many are past, a reprobate and past being able to repent, but many people are broken and hurting and confused. And there's room for them at the foot of the cross. If they turn their hearts to Yeshua, and turn away from their sin and embrace the truth and the love of Elohim. The Bible warns us against pride. I'm not going to read all the scriptures. I have a whole list of scriptures here that talk about this. 
Look up the word pride in your Bible program, in your concordance, or whatever, and you will see what the Bible has to say about it. So now we are going to conclude this talk. And my reaction to so-called June being Pride Month. And I have just shot an arrow of truth and focused a beam of light into the darkness of this evil, into the darkness with the hopes that maybe somebody will wake up and see through all this obfuscation, this deception, this delusion, this smoke and mirrors, and the lies that Satan the devil is putting off on a lot of people to believe a lie instead of the truth. May Yah have mercy on us all. Amen.